I will continue basically where I ended up. Uh, yeah, this talk will slowly go to the direction of many body localization and uh, Arnav Das kind of insisted that I, I talk about this. We'll see how it goes. I'm happy to catch tomatoes if you, anyone has them. So, but anyway, so before I do that, let me just continue with uh, milder stuff. So uh, I remind you where we ended um, uh, yesterday. So, and basically I was talking about generator of adiabatic transformations. And again, especially for those who were not here, I remind you what it is. So quantum mechanically, this is basically a generator of unitary transformations, which rotates eigenstates, right? Rotates in a sense of this unitary rotations. So if we talk about classical systems and throughout this talk and, and concerning uh, late MBL as well, I want to parallel classical and quantum systems because they're very, very similar. Uh, so for classical systems, this is generate of canonical transformations, uh, which basically changes canonical variables, translates, rotates, or does more complex uh, canonical transformation. And in particular, uh, for Hamiltonian systems, we are concerned with transformations which keep long time trajectories invariant. So if you think about this in quantum language, uh, uh, you can ask, what happens if you add perturbation which commutes with Hamiltonian? Well, you know, eigenstates will not change. Now you can ask, what's the equivalent statement in classical systems? Well, time average of trajectories do not change. If you don't see immediately how it works, think about quantum mechanics applied to say gas in this room. So in principle, it should work, right? It's just classical limit of a quantum system. If we do time average of any initial probability distribution, it will project to a statistical mixture of eigenstates. And because eigenstates don't change, my uh, long time probability distribution also doesn't change, right? If I start from the same initial state. So, and A is a generator of these canonical transformations. And we argued also that uh, in exact sense in chaotic systems, they, they are not defined, but if we ask for these canonical transformations, which preserve my trajectories up to time mu, sorry, one over mu, then everything is well defined. So this is the object A. And then we discussed that we can relate this object A, well, we related it to a conservation law, but we also related it to, to low frequency, limit of the spectral function. And I remind you the spectral function is just standard outer correlation functions is the same you use when you compute Fermi golden rule rate or when you compute noise, sometimes it's called noise. So this is basically uh, uh, symmetric. And the observable which enters there conjugate to parameter lambda. So it's basically lambda is direction of deformation of Hamiltonian, d lambda h is actual term you're adding, right? If Lambda is electric uh, field, and this is your polarization. If magnetic field, magnetization, and so on. Okay, and then I just want to highlight this formula again, uh, up to this cutoff mu, it's essentially phi divided by omega squared. So we see that uh, obviously this is like enhanced, uh, this integral is enhanced at small frequencies. And we see that by studying low frequency response uh, of, uh, uh, my system to this uh, observable d lambda h, we know how easy it is to adiabatically transform in this direction. And conversely, if we find a direction where it's easy to adiabatically transform, we know there is no, uh, there is small low frequency response. Okay. So now let me go back to the same result I, I, I discussed uh, before in ETH, but now I will think about finite cutoff mu because I, at the end, I don't want to talk about eigenstates. They don't define, they don't define in classical systems. So I look again in this integral and I ask how it asymptotically behaves at, at, at small frequencies. So if I have ETH systems, when we really discussed that the spectral function below tau less time, it goes to a constant. And we see immediately that it's integral essentially d omega over omega squared uh, up to cutoff, lower cutoff mu, so it's one over mu. So we see that there is a symptotic characteristic, asymptotic divergence 
of chi, which will be constant one of omega scaling. And if we, ha we have a system with a spectral gap, which means that our spectral function is zero below some cutoff scale, uh, and this, uh, as we argued, happens, for example, in integrable systems, then uh, our chi saturates. Yeah, so it's interesting, like a remark I saw in some talks that if you take a, this matrix element constant that this integral, well, which of course translates to sum over n and m, one over omega and m squared, it's also called spectral com complexity and it's at least used in literature to characterize random matrix. Good, now let me, I, I promised uh, before to say uh, why in integrable systems we expect uh, spectral function to vanish. As far as I understand, it's non-trivial statement, at least when I spoke to, to limited group of people who study classical chaos, they, they were not like sure about this, but this, this is what happened. So basically I told you, if we say that adiabatic transformations are well de uh, defined, we must have vanishing spectral function. So we must have no response at small frequencies. And if we think about, uh, uh, intuitively how we think about integrable systems, it actually makes sense. And later I'll show example and we'll quantify this. So if you think about what's classical integrable motion, well, it's a superposition of this one detour as, as we discussed, right? But usually each frequency is finite. In order to have a zero frequency, uh, we must fine tune to a special point, some degeneracy point or some conical point or flat point. And usually this fine tuning uh, of course, gives you like small probability. So I remind you that when we compute spectral function classically, we average over phase space. Analog of averaging over eigenstate is average, eigenstate is averaging over phase space. So if we can average over whole phase space, it's like taking trace. We can average over microcanonical shell, it's like quantum mechanically microcanonical shell. And the, yes, there are always trajectories which are special, but if they have zero weight, it doesn't affect like statistically integral. Um, uh, conversely, we can ask classically uh, when we expect um, constant spectral function. And this is actually a result of standard hydrodynamics or I would say standard kinetic approaches. So, uh, you know, when you write uh, this type of equations, they usually like Markovian equations like of arbitrary form at long times, they typically have exponential relaxation. Like in diffusion, it's very explicit, right? So we can always, when we solve this diffusion equation, we can go to Fourier space and each mode basically satisfies imaginary Schrodinger equations, they all decay. And if you wait long enough time, that uh, time longer than tau is time, the cell squared over D, then uh, only one mode survives because everything decays exponentially. So all high exponents can be ignored. And then we, we end up with exponential relaxation. But the Fourier transform of exponential is of course Lorentzian and this saturates. So it's actually a very interesting observation, which I want to highlight. So the same result, which follows from the random matrix theory follows from the diffusion equation or any other kinetic equation. And I say, oh, this is just a coincidence. But it's kind of a funny coincidence because it happens exactly at the same frequency scale, exactly at the same tau scale. I, I'm not sure if there is any uh, microscopic explanation for this, but it's, it's basically something uh, worth mentioning. Yeah, so this is like what, what I'm, I'm just repeating it here. So uh, we basically see that from eigenstate thermalization and diffusion hydrodynamics, whatever you call it, we get the same result. And this again, like a hint that this random matrix theory is, is about thermalization. It should be closely related. I, I wish I could be more specific about that. So one needs to define something like local ETH and space and so on. So it, there is actually a, uh, an opposite statement uh, that if you have integrable systems, which have, do, uh, do have spectral gap, then hydrodynamics should fail. And in particular, diffusion equation, which was observed in integrable systems, is bound to fail after Taurus time when you reach boundary. And that's exactly what's happening. So it's interesting that this diffusion equation, which people found, 
like we saw heard the talks from Pedram about KPZ, but KPZ is like borderline case between diffusion and ballistic. So this diffusion and likely KPZ and ballistic, they all work up only until the boundary. After that, like all these equations should fail for integrable systems. And this is as far as I know what not studied. Okay, so now I, I, I'm kind of almost done with analytics. There will be a little bit more, but mostly I will switch to numerics and we'll be kind of showing some results and trying to interpret this in view of what I said. So how does chaos energeticity emerge? So now I told you about integrable systems. I told you about ergodic systems. And I talked a lot about this adiabatic transformation as a probe of so far ergodicity. So, um, so the model which appeared in, in many times already, uh, we take XXZ model, it's non-integral trivial model. And then we break integrability. We tried two different ways it seems it doesn't really matter. Well, there are some subtleties, but generically it doesn't matter, but you can find very special situations like you use some boundary link or whatever when story is more interesting. But these are really a special integrability breaking perturbation. It's interesting that if you introduce just magnetic field in one side in the middle, it seems from the point of your ergodicity to do basically the same job as, as next nearest neighbor coupling. Uh, of course, time scales will be different, but overall the story is similar. Okay, and this was actually a very big surprise. So this result, it's from Mahit uh, Pandey, I, I remember brought to me. And uh, first when I saw it, I thought, well, great, we got it. So we got, uh, I just remind you what it is. So this is fidelity, susceptibility scaled by system size versus uh, uh, system size for this perturbation, my lambda is this deformation delta, it's integrable deformation. So now this dashed line is integrable result. Remember I mentioned it's a polynomial, but it's in log scale polynomial looks like uh, square root. So, and then you break integrability by a tiny amount. So we are talking about very, very small numbers. So if you try to look into level statistics, you won't see anything. So this is in units of 10 to the minus three, it goes from 0.2 to five. And then you see what happens is that F uh, perturbation uh, is uh, getting smaller and smaller. Uh, you reproduce integral result almost exactly for longer, longer time. And then there is almost like sharp singularity and you become ergodic. So we thought, okay, we got it. So this is integrable, this is ETH, we are done. And you might notice that even the slope is the same. So it must be log two. But the story, as I said, turned out to be more interesting and I actually bugged my hit a lot, double check, triple check and so on before we understood that what I told you is just a lie, it cannot happen. So we see there is a sharp transition. We see there is the same slope, again, with a numerical precision, but at least slope doesn't change much. So we see that this chi is indeed a super sensitive probe of chaos. So we can detect it like very early on. So if you want, you can interpret as minimum value of epsilon for a given system size when you start to see chaos. So like for system size 17, it's like two to the 10 minus four. Uh, this is anisotropic. And yeah, it's not Heisenberg, but they all look the same. Uh, it's not a ground state. It's infinite temperature. So what, what do you mean by ground? Yes, but I mean, we are summing over all the states. So any states are kind of measure zero. And we didn't, we tried both positive delta, uh, sorry, positive, bigger than one, less than one. It, it, qualitatively, it looks the same. Slopes might be different. Yeah, once you start going to ground states and so on, this will be important, but we don't see any. Yeah. And we, we do infinite temperature averaging. So, uh, and we are dominated by smallest gaps and there are gapless excitations. So we are dominated by this gapless excitation. Okay. So, but then the surprise is the last line. 
So if you look into the slope, again, within numerical accuracy, I'll show much better numerical data later with, uh, done with Marcus Riegel group. So within numerical accuracy, the slope is twice as big. It's not e power s, it's e power 2s. And it turns out, this is your second, it's the maximal possible slope you can get. So it's basically uh, your matrix elements become instead of e to the minus s over two, which is the th result, they become of the order of one. And then you remember that in chi, well, I, I don't want to go back, in equation you get energy denominator squared, so it will be e to the minus two s in the minimum. So the whole thing is e power two s. So matrix elements actually close to the transition are exponentially bigger than in the th. It's quantum interpretation. And classical, of course, we'll talk about slow dynamics, yes. Yeah, yeah, I'll come to that. I mean, you can, you can use these words, but here the system at these parameters and this system size, the system does not formalize. So you get slow dynamics. So if you want, this is your MBL state without disorder. It does not thermalize. It has slow dynamics. It conserved quantities didn't decay yet. I'll come to that. But if you take system bigger and bigger, presumably this will be your personalization, right? So I'll show many more examples and I'll start with classical, but let me just give you a punchline of what we found. And as I said, every single story, including um, uh, MBL fits this picture so far. So modular that there are some systems which never have a TH regime, it's like which satisfies KM. So basically if I loosely interpret uh, this scale is log of integrability breaking. And this is sort of like system size. Instead of system size, it could be one over each bar. Uh, I'll come to that. So it's basically a parameter which controls if you want Hilbert space size. Then, uh, uh, um, yeah, and another important so point, like I come back, which it comes to a uh, point that if I deal in some dynamic limit, you can think about this as time. So whatever finite size effects they translate into finite time effects. So we can work an in infinite system size. This diagram survives if you think about this. System. So essentially, if system size is uh, uh, a time is sufficiently short and integrability breaking is small, of course you see integrable dynamics blue in a sense that you have everything nice. You can define your local integrals of motion, quasi particles, whatever you want. Then you go to this maximal chaos regime in a sense of maximal sensitivity. And people define maximal chaos in different sense. I, 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 again, I don't want to insist that this is better definition, but I just want to shorten notations. I don't want to each time repeat maximal sensitivity, maximal fidelity. I, I just, for this talk, use maximal chaos in this sense. And later, much later, we will go to ETH. And if you want, this is like KM regime. Whether it's finite or infinite, a separate story. Now it depends on the system, we'll come there. But what I will argue that it doesn't matter whether your system is thermodynamically large or thermodynamically small. You have parametrically huge regime, which is non thermalizing which is chaotic, uh, but uh, it's uh, not, in, we cannot call it integrable. I would say it's maximum, what actually David called integrable case, I would call maximally chaotic case. And, and I'll, I'll talk about this. So, um, so, and this chaotic but non rigoric regime we see, uh, as I just uh, mentioned already, and I'll talk more about this, we should see extremely slow relaxation. And this is because this chi is related to low frequency spectral function. So if I have big chi, it means I have huge low frequency response, which means I have long time dynamics. And I'll talk more about this. So, and here I just, again, want to repeat this maximal chaos is not maximal mixing, thermalization, ergodicity, whatever term you choose. So, and this was discussed in say, Tamash random circuit model, so SYK, like maximal Lapunov exponents and so on. But I want to say, it's not that stupid to call this maximal chaos because I showed you examples in our everyday experience, maximally chaotic systems are not those which thermalize. Remember I had the pictures laminar flows. Maximally chaotic are those which are 
about which we can say the least, are actually this complicated turbulent, like think about atmosphere. I mean, maximally chaotic systems or whatever. We have this hurricanes, like all these weather patterns and so on. And these are almost integrable systems. We won't have them in solids, which are interacting much more and have way bigger level of exponents. Yeah. Suppose I didn't know about the sensitivity detection. I'm just taking a local operator and tracking its dynamics in time. If I am in this maximal chaotic regime, would I see something similar to what we normally call prethermal, or would it be different? Yeah, you can maybe call it prethermal, but I will try to say it's much more universal. So very often people say about prethermal as some kind of kinetic equations and so on, but it seems to be not the case. Yes, you can say it prethermal. Because as I said, finite sizes translate to finite times. So you see this non-thermal state, which slowly evolves. It could be indeed evolving GG. But what I will argue that it's not just smaller diffusion coefficient or whatever. This is like very small dynamics. Again, how universal this, I'm not really insisting. I'm just saying at least many systems are behaving like this. Even the systems we have, Marcos mentioned, FGR works. It turns out it works when amplitude is big enough. When it's small enough, and this is in, in the same Marcos paper, actually FGR breaks down. You start seeing extremely slow dynamics again. So, and let me just try to say uh, that this definition is not, again, stupid from the point of view of classical physics. So I come back to this example, which I showed, this nonlinear oscillator. And now I take two trajectories. I'm basically doing exactly what, what, what I promised to do. I, of course, it's fine-tuned, but the point is that if nonlinearity is big, I will have enough points like this in my phase space. So I take oscillator, uh, two oscillators, basically, uh, first with identical pre pre frequencies and some nonlinearity. And then I take, you know, normally we define chaos. If you want, we, uh, I don't know, send two identical kids to the same room, give them, you know, buckets of, uh, I don't know, paint and give them different kicks in the ass and just see how traces of, of, of this uh, die like uh, deviate. So what we are doing here is slightly different. We have really two identical kits, two identical buckets, two identical kicks, everything is identical, but slightly different rooms. But we also look, so, and then we get different trajectories, not because initial conditions different, but uh, our Hamiltonian is slightly different. But then when we look at this, I mean, obviously it's chaotic, right? You just see it. But how I characterize it? Well, I'm not going to do it with Lyapunov exponents. They're tiny because you see, and they're very different because here I'm kind of integrable for very, very, very long time. Oh, I forgot to say, what's shown is a diabatic invariant for one oscillator. Think about number of photons in quantum language for one oscillator. And it keeps oscillating. If I have integrable dynamics, it will keep oscillating forever. But then suddenly it starts getting some chaotic. So what I'm saying is that instead we ask how hard it is to map this trajectory to this trajectory. And then you see immediately it should be very hard. And this guy actually quantifies. It. And amazingly, the information is contained in spectral function. So finding this canonical transformation is super difficult. But saying how, difficult, how complex it is, how big it is, is very easy. You just measure spectral function, divide by frequency squared, and evaluate. And now it's also clear that chaos should be a measure of time, especially at weak integrability breaking. Because if I would wait up to here, I'll say, oh, the system is not chaotic. If I wait longer, it becomes chaotic. And this is also our experience. If you saw simulations in models, in many, many models, flow care, classical, quantum, whatever, you very often see it's like pre stable, 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 and suddenly it drops out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, omega one, omega two, yeah. Well, Losh uh, uh yeah, it will pick up Lyapunov type exponents and people look at this, but I, I don't see direct relation with uh, adiabatic gauge potential. It's kind of interesting in quantum systems, the sky is related to Fisher information. It is Fisher information. 
classically, I try to do it for basically Fisher information of time average distribution. If anyone wants to do it, it's fun. What I got is almost related, but not exactly. And I couldn't because I'm getting Poisson brackets of P and A. So it's not exactly A squared, but it's similar. So you can say it's basically what's the Fisher information of time average distribution. And it looks similar to, to Chi, but I couldn't map it exactly. Okay. Actually, one, one more question. Uh, how long does this maximally chaotic system? I mean, is there a forever? Uh, can be forever. Can be forever. It's a symptomatic regime. In quantum systems, there is always Heisenberg scale, and that introduces finite size effect. I, I'll talk about this. So, yeah, quantum mechanics actually spoils many things in in a way. So, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll explain what I mean. So let's take a model, and this work was done by actually two undergraduates, Cedric Lim, Kirill Matir, who are not even in the U, and, and Michael Flynn, who just finished his postdoc. So we took, actually, it's, it's one of the standard models. We did the search, one of the standard models studied in the 90s for like chaos, quantum and classical. So we have two spins, but these spins are not spin one half, but spin S. And when you send S to infinity, the, this model becomes equivalent to basically two unit rotators, right? So these are little spins which satisfy Poisson break. So, uh, so these spins have in, in interactions which are familiar to us, right? So they can be anisotropic. So it's SX, SX, SY, SY, SZ, SZ in general. And also they can have like quadratic nonlinearities on site nonlinearities, which is similar. So in general, they're like six parameters. Uh, you keep H bar, it's usual normalization to make sure that S equals to infinity limit is well defined. And again, we took it the uh, same numbers from this model. And then, uh, as I said, people studied it to death and it's known that there is sub-integrable manifold. So when you satisfy these constraints, it's highly non-trivial manifold, but in particular, when all A's are equal to zero, this is always satisfied. So we took like simple message from this so if this model is just has arbitrary couplings, Jx, J1, Jz, it's always integrable. And so if we had non-zero A's in general, if you don't fine tune them to this condition, we break integrability. Okay. So this is just to, to show that this model is chaotic in normal sense. So this is like, for example, of XXZ model, two nearby trajectories. And this is if you break integrability a little bit here, we just see trajectories diverge, we have Lyapunov exponents and so on. Okay. So what are the fish, the coordinates? Oh, this is one spin, trajectories of one. I, I, I don't know how to plot four dimensional space. So this is trajectories for one of the spins, say spin one. So we take, this is unit sphere, right? We take spin one and see its trajectory. Then we change initial conditions a little bit and Oh, uh, I'll come to that. No, no, no. That's why it's chaos without a reality. Yeah. So if you would use level space in the definition of chaos, you will say this model is always integrable. At least you will say, I don't know what you will say, but I'll show the results. You will never get ETH. I would say. So, there is one particular limit which you can analyze. Usually nonlinear systems hard to analyze. This is XXZ model. Because there, there are always two conservation laws because this model is always integrable without A. But they're very complicated. We don't know how to find them. And we didn't find them in literature. But if it's XXZ, we know what's the other conservation law about energy. It's magnetization. And if we do this, then actually the work was done for us already in the same paper the model maps exactly to a particle in one dimensional potential. And this potential depends on conservation laws, perhaps not surprising. And I want to highlight it's normal quartic potential. There is nonlinearity, which only depends on anisotropy. It doesn't care about initial conditions, energies, and so on. And this nonlinearity vanishes an isotropic point, which makes sense because if I have Heisenberg model, two spins precess around total spin. I have trivial harmonic motion. So everywhere else, it's nonlinear. Nonlinearity can be positive or negative, and quadratic thing can change sign. It's just nasty. It's a function of 
J's energy and magnetization. So it's very complicated function. We even didn't make sense. But basically this is kind of snapshots of potentials which you can see depending on your initial conditions. I mean, of course, as I said, beta only depends on, on anisotropy, but uh, the rest depends on initial condition. And then we can get basically a standard quartic potential. We can get inverted potential, but here everything is fine. Energy is always below the maximum. We always have bounded motion, so everything is good. And then we can also have this double well potential. And then we can, it actually was mostly Kirill's work, we can extract uh, at least smallest frequency for each of this potential, or, or just, I would say, frequency of motion for each potential because we know energy, and then find the smallest frequency. And then from the smallest frequency, uh, we can extract the spectral function, basically the uh, low frequency tail of the spectral function. And the result is actually as expected that it's actually exponentially suppressed. Because if you think about this, in order to get zero frequency, you have to be in one of these settled points. But you really need to exponentially fine tune there. Otherwise, period will be uh, big. So, and there is exponentially small probability to find initial condition, which is here. So, and basically there are some subtleties involved that in two regimes, it's either e to the minus one over omega, but one over square root of omega, but you see it just, spectral function vanishes like crazy. This is kind of justifies what I tried to, to uh, say using hand waving arguments. And then if you look into the spectral function, we see that indeed it's, it's, it's a little bit noisy. And by the way, this is quantum and classical data. So that's, you, you asked about this. So yeah, you just see when spin largest is 100, well, 100 times 100 is 10,000, big Hilbert space. So we, we see that if you increase S, uh, you kind of follow this uh, S equals to infinity, but of course you start deviating. But uh, classically you can go beyond, but here again, you have finite time. You cannot just simulate forever. Uh, but essentially you agree with this prediction, so it's exponential. So spectral function vanishes. And, and by the way, this is exponential tail I mentioned about operator spreading, even though the model is integrable, it's, um, it's the same as non-integrable model. Now we XYZ model. XYZ model we cannot solve analytically. So we can only do numerics. Uh, but it's the same story except that it vanishes as omega squared spectral function. And that's okay, integral is finite, high uh, converges. So same exponential tail. And then again, you just see that this is spin 50 quantum simulation. Yeah, there are some small finite size effects, but essentially we just reproduce quantum and classical really agree, there is no big difference. On top of each other, this is integrable case, but wait, wait, wait a little bit. It, it's going to become much more interesting. So basically, if we didn't know that these models are integrable and just would look into the spectral function or chi, so chi is finite, uh, we would conclude that these are integrable systems in the sense that you can have this local canonical transformation which would deform between two trajectories. So if I would show you same pictures as I showed before in integrable case, I will see slightly different trajectories and I can just squeeze my variables a little bit. So think about this like action angle variables just smoothly transform through each other. Okay. Now let's break integrability. So we choose some parameter X, which characterizes how non-integrable it is. Just want to highlight X equals to infinity is again integrable for trivial reasons. So, but somewhere in, the, in between, it's kind of maximally non-integrable. We choose some random, just arbitrary couplings to make sure we are not commensurate or whatever. Just Michael came up with these numbers. If you ask why, why didn't we put golden ratio? We, we it was so disrespectful. Anyway, so, uh, and then uh, uh, you see uh, what's shown here on the left, we have a spectral function. And this is, um, uh, well, an, an important result and I'm, I'm going to come back to it many times. So what you see is that this system evolves low, long frequency tail, which probably lasts forever. Of course, we cannot, check numerically that it does last forever. Uh, but I just want to highlight, so this model has no single small parameter. Our integrability breaking is big. So we actually hope that this model would be ergodic. 
But it turns out that we had a bad choice. This model is never ergodic. So I'll come back to that. So it's kind of KM threshold. If you want, I have integrable limit at x equals to zero, at x equals to infinity, and KM thresholds. And you would think in between it will be ergodic. But no, KM thresholds kind of cross. So both limits are kind of cross. So what we see, we see, develop this low frequency tail, which lasts forever. If you have quantum system, then uh, uh, we see that we, as we increase spin, so AT is still real, uh, we kind of approach this tail. Uh, dashed lines already extrapolation using some scaling theory. So I won't go into details, but you, you kind of see if it's a power law, then some scaling, it's kind of critical theory. We can apply some finite size scaling and so on. Anyway, this is just a guide to an eye, just to show that if we would go to spin, say 300, if we could do it, we will probably get a dashed line most likely, and you will see this uh, much better power law. For available spins, it will be actually much harder to extract this power law. Then we can uh, ask, uh, what about chi? And chi diverges with mu faster than one over mu. Remember I said, constant is integrable, one over mu is ergodic, this is faster than one over mu. It's more chaotic in a sense. It's harder to do these canonical transformations. Uh, uh, right. Okay. So now let's check like standard measures. And this I'm coming back to this question. So we, we tried first quantum measures. So uh, this RMT, we work in the right sectors, like this one I don't know, global spin symmetry we, we take this into account. So uh, this is the level statistic as a function of x. It's kind of Poisson here at x equals to zero, not surprisingly. It's Poisson when x is very big, not surprisingly. And in between, it just reaches some strange value. I just want to highlight it doesn't go up, it goes down. I'm not saying it will go down all the way to zero, but at least it does not approach Wigner Dyson. So in this sense, I will, and this has to be the case, because if it's ETH, we must have constant spectral function. So the fact that spectral function increases means that it cannot be ETH. So again, we cannot rule out from these plots that when S goes to an infinity, it won't reverse and suddenly will start going up. But uh, as I said, classically, we see there are no small parameters and you, we, one has to come up with some very strange number, small number out of numbers of the order of one, like one over two pi power six. So if this is the case, so if you look into level distribution, you just see, well, you know, it's closer to Poisson and to Wigner dice. And this is maximally non-integrable point. So in this sense, I want to highlight again, level statistics is extremely bad measure of things. And we tried, you can tune yourself to microcanonical ensemble, some select energies, whatever. It doesn't change, it doesn't help. And the system is not ergodic period. I mean, we also look classically, this is distance between time average ensembles and microcanonical ensembles. And it, I mean, it slightly decays. Again, we cannot really rule out that if you are in, in a very long time limit, it will somehow go to infinity. I just want to highlight maximally non-integrable cases actually here. And uh, uh, you just see, man, it doesn't approach certain, at least within reasonable time scales. Now, situation becomes much more interesting when we go close to integrability. And there we go many more surprises. So uh, yeah, data is a bit noisy because close to integrability, you are much more, and there are these resonances in quantum systems. We did some averaging, but anyway, so maybe one can get the beta data, but this is good enough to see what's going on. So this is, I would say, this is integrability breaking, which is not too small. You talk about one, one half, it's not four, but it's not 0.01, right? And then uh, what happens is that in the spectral function, look in the purple line, it's basically classical data, not basically it's classical data, and we start to see universality emerge. So what we see that spectral function wants to goes down, so the system is like integrable, but at some point it just starts going up. And it goes up with actually a slope, which becomes closer and closer to one, come back to this point. One means I have one over omega spectral function, and that's the maximal divergence I can have by the sum rule. Integral of the spectral function is just variance of your observable. 
So again, we are not claiming it's one and one actually cannot be realized because it diverges, but it seems to approach one. Uh, and one means logarithmic and time relaxation. If you take, go back to Fourier space, one of omega means logarithmic in time. I'll hopefully get to MBL, you'll see many of features like this. So the other interesting thing is that quantum mechanically, we start to see huge finite size effects, really huge. So in a sense that this is spin 100 and X is one half, as I said, it's not that um, small. So remember 100 was enough in integrable case. It was enough in strongly non-integrable case. We could see at least all the features of classical model. Here, we would just miss the whole thing completely. So we see as you increase as we kind of slowly approach. So if you make X smaller, we won't see even that. We would think we actually make totally wrong conclusions about some dynamic limits. And again, this, this of course will have parallels with MBL. So uh, finite size analysis here was extremely difficult. Why, we don't know. Uh, but I would say uh, even here uh, for X equals to one half, in order to, if you keep extrapolating what's going on, you need like S equals to thousand to start to see some slope. And if you choose X equals to 0.1, there you still see classically a nice slope, you need more than 10,000. So there's some strange dependence. So spin uh, or Hilbert spice, uh, space dimension, which is required to see asymptotic limit, let me say thermodynamic limit or uh, ultimate limit, whatever, uh, uh, is huge. Okay, so, and quantum systems in a way, they look like more integrable. I don't want to say more, less chaotic, right? Let's go, because this is, looks a bit like a TH, but in reality, you have more, much more spectral weight, so your chi is much more divergent. Okay, so this was a classical model, and I'm, this actually was a recent paper which was just published, but this was a bit older paper, which we did uh, together with uh, a group of Marcus Riegel and Tyler LeBlanc, who at that time actually graduated already, uh, but he was basically the person who did all the work. It was also with these cells. Actually, most of work on, I'm going to present now was done with this. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, we took the same situation. So this is basically same XXZ model written in, in a different way. Uh, and then we induce integrability breaking with second nearest neighbors. Again, we try different things, it looks all the same. Everything is again non-commensurate to make sure we don't have some problems. And now I will not show you spectral function, I will show you chi. And this is kind of shows the full crossover transition from ETH to integrability. And I want to highlight basically exact same uh, points. This is now quantum model, no classical limit. Instead of increasing S, we increase system size, but you see roughly the same features. So like horizontal line is my integrability breaking parameter. It's very small here. It's actually, it's big here, but here the model is again integral. Because when I have very big second nearest name interaction, the model is trivially integral. So maximal, I would say non-integrability is somewhere here around one, right, in this point. Second nearest neighbor interaction. Easy, yes. So, um, and then uh, there are two different observables. They look the same, so let's just look into one of them. So what we plot is chi divided by chi th. So chi th will be this e power s. So this is the way to scale. The way reason we do it, because then it's very easy to see where the system is ergodic and where it's non-ergodic. So, and then you just see different lines of different system sizes. So largest will be like 24. Oh, I didn't put it in. It's 18 to 24. Oh, no, it's here. Sorry, I didn't see it. 18 to 24. Yes. So, and you see like, we see very nice uh, ETH scaling. Again, it does not prove that it's ETH, but because it freezes and you expect ETH eventually, this is it. So, and then what you see what's happening is that as you, increase system size, you need smaller and smaller integrability to induce a th. This is of course expected. You see that this peak of chi nicely develops. So this is exactly this sort of maximally chaotic regime. And then you see that left of this peak, it's the model 
which should be like integrable is a mess. So what we should expect is actually this ratio should go to zero because in integrable case, chi is small, we divide by something big. Instead, we see that, yeah, there is some kind of like crossing ish point. And probably if you go here to tremendously small perturbations, it will become zero. And that's again, what I want to highlight. Remember my colorful picture. Transition to chaos will be somewhere here. Transition to ergodicity is here. In thermodynamic limit, yes, everything is ergodic. But still, there is no direct transition between integrability and ergodicity. I have huge this KEM regime. Parametrically, it's the tremendous. It's exponentially gross. We, we, we don't know the scale. So this um, uh, transition here goes down like very quickly. It's easy exponential high degree polynomial. But we don't, want, we don't have any theory for this, like what you need for ergodicity. Uh, there are some mathematical estimate, like there was one paper this found, which uh, put a lower bound one over L power 160. Um, that's the only thing I understood from this paper. Yes, it could be power 160, we have no idea. But this is definitely much slower than this line. Yes. No, transition to chaos is not even shown here. It will, where chi over chi th will be to the minus s, when chi will become polynomially small. Here you don't see it. You have to go to much, much smaller perturbations to see it, right? Because even at this point, chi is exponentially big, right? Here it's e to the two s. So you don't see it here. Um, yeah, but in the previous paper I showed this transition seems very sharp, we, but because we already studied it, we didn't do it here. So, <clears throat> Yeah, okay, so just uh, to, to uh, say uh, maybe one more time. So we need very small perturbation to induce ergodicity. We need much, much smaller perturbation to induce chaos. And we have like very complicated paths. By the way, on the right of the peak, like the system quickly becomes ergodic and there is no another scale. So basically ETH scale and maximum scale, they would be the same, they move in parallel. So ergodic regime is much simpler. So it's again, I kind of talked with this a lot. If you want to study MBL system, start from ergodic regime. Don't start from localized regime. Like many mistakes were made because of this attempt to start from localized space. Yeah. Oh, because it's again integrable. Because you see large delta, it, it becomes again integral. It's much harder to analyze. So we didn't analyze it, but you see there is still similar behavior. <laughs> yes, yes, good question. Yeah, now I'm ready to catch the matrix. So yeah, we uh, actually, this paper was rejected from PRL just because of this point. Usually you get rejections because you don't put something, but sometimes you get rejections because you put extra information. So uh, here we just said, okay, let's do the same for Anderson one. And now I'm transitioning to MBL. So we decided in that paper that we will not look into like I know standard regime, we'll look into BA regime. So we'll go to Anderson insulator with everything of the order of one. The relation length of the order of one here is like four or five, I don't know. Uh, all parameters of the order of one, the sort of the order of one. So if the model is known in here, delta is interaction in the language of fermions. So this is Anderson insulator. And so if it's Anderson insulator, we know it's localized. Um, and I don't want to say word integrable though, but say it's localized. We have Poisson statistics and so on. And if uh, we include interactions, it should become ergodic, right? And then we repeat it. So system sizes are smaller because there is no translational symmetry. The largest is 18, but you start to see exactly the same behavior. So you see again, uh, uh, as we increase system size, this critical interaction goes down. It goes at a smaller rate, uh, but it still goes either exponentially or high degree polynomial, at least one over all cubed, this, this is this numerics. Uh, so this maximal chaos is e power 2s. So you just see again, uh, we need a bit smaller point. It's still on the left of here to induce chaos in, in, or to go back to this um, integrable susceptibility. Yes, here the model is integral, by the way, not because Anderson is integrable, but because I have non interacting particles. So maybe. So I would say that this whole thing, this whole regime, well, actually, all this regime is chaos. But this is 
this is ergodic, this is modern health, this is mixing. And this is chaotic non-mixing, chaotic non-ergodic. Integrable in this sense, I don't want to use the word integrable. Anderson, free, I don't know. Uh, this is again not shown here. It would occur somewhere here. You, you must have this ratio to be exponential. So anyway, uh, it's, it's definitely contradiction to BAA paper because it's not that it's qualitative uh, and similar. We don't even see any traces of slowing down. So like interactions are pretty small. We don't see any signatures so that clean model and, and localized models. Yes. Yeah, we did not, yeah, it, it flows uh, because we look into the ratio. If you divide, we, we didn't make sense. It's like basically there is no reason, at least we don't see any reason why chi over chi ETH should be one. Maybe we are missing something, but this is not exact crossing point. If you look carefully, it kind of drifts. Uh, these lines move and they become sharper. So I believe that it will disappear because this line should move. At least in the clean case, no one doubts that. There is similar crossing point that it will keep moving. And then this crossing point can escape. Yeah, but I'm just saying this point cannot be constant because if I wait longer and longer, if this point is constant, I should get this curve. So then I, I, I need to come up with this theory. Again, yeah, this is interpretation of humanity. And actually this work with this was done after uh, uh, work with, um, with Marcos was done after uh, work was done with this. And this was actually motivated by, by uh, the work uh, with Tomas and Lev. So they came up with this paper, I'll, I'll uh, comment. Uh, I hope I'll have time to talk about this and be helpful stuff. Um, so, and we decided by that time we had paper with Mahit and we decided, okay, let's just test. So we, we didn't want to prove or disprove or anything. We just said, okay, let's just test what happens if you use Chi now in standard MBL model. And now I can save time because David talked about this today. So it's, it's, it's standard. Actually, we chose this model precisely because it's so standard. And then we saw a drift. It's the same maximum. Now, if you want it, it drifts to the right because if you want quote unquote integrable point will be here. So it's ETH at small w, but then we start to see this chaos. We see this roughly e power to s, not exactly, but in the bigger finite size effect, it moves to the right. Again, you might talk about this point, but it's because of scaling. If you look into unscaled susceptibility, I just want to say like everything drifts to the right. So, and, and uh, interestingly, uh, so that's, when we started suspecting that something goes wrong, then if you just plot, uh, see how this point moves and compare with, with the results from this um, uh, Ljubljana, uh, uh, say breakthrough paper, right? Uh, it, it matches. So this is, uh, I guess, Lev can answer more precisely what, what different lines mean, but it's basically how critical disorders uh, scales with system size if you analyze uh, spectrum form factor statistics. Everything is consistent. So I'll take a detour and let me say again. So I do believe that MBL is an interesting phase. I don't want to like, I, I, we did many enemies, uh, but I at the same time do believe that uh, the literature is full of mistakes, misstatements, incorrect analysis. It, it was amazing you were going through. And I'll just go through some of them, some of the papers. I, uh, as I said, I, I, I just took them. I don't want to like offend anyone or any, uh, but we are scientists, we have to talk about it. So David kind of said what the problems are. I'll kind of highlight that they are much bigger than we might think. Okay, so this is essentially the picture of MBL. Actually, David talked about this and Fox space localization is one of layer of MBL. There are other ideas. So let me not go into this. So this is like a regional uh, paper, how it was sought as localization in, in Fox space. Um, so let me just skip this. So now let me just go through sort of historical evidence of MBL. Uh, there is the standard model, which is XXZ or Heisenberg. And uh, uh, there were many papers. I, I, we took with these like most cited papers. So again, just our choice. Actually, I never worked on, on MBL myself before, so we heard some talks. 
Anyway, so this is like, uh, was one of uh, such papers which extracted a localization transition from this level crossings. And then they estimated it's 3.7. So you just see they look into level statistics. So this is Wigner Dyson, this is Poisson, and then somewhere there is approximate crossing point. Of course, within some precision, uh, they got this number. Uh, uh, there were other papers, so this is like another paper, also well cited from the same year. They look into something which is like fidelity susceptibility, not exactly. So we just look into ratio of, of, the, of nearest neighbor matrix element divided by energy denominator. Fidelity susceptibility will be sum of the squares. So it's actually when you're ergodic, it's the same. When you are in this mix uh, regime, they're very different. But anyway, so the idea was that if you are uh, ergodic, matrix elements are smaller than energy denominators. And if you are integrable, you again, like matrix elements between nearest neighbors are very small because uh, everything is integrable. There are no matrix elements. And uh, then you just see that if you increase system size and look uh, into uh, this G, when disorder is small, everything uh, moves uh, uh, to, to uh, so G basically uh, moves to the right. It gets, uh, I mean, it's a distribution, but it uh, gets bigger and bigger as you expect from ETH. If disorder is big, so this is MBL phase, it gets broader. David also talked about this, but it moves to the left. And then in between, it's exactly like the maximum. So this is the transition and same real value like 3.6. And there were many more papers uh, which were estimating transition at the same point. So, and there was a proof, I guess you'll hear more about um, you know, this next week. Uh, there were experiments, which I'll show there was a renormalization group uh, we heard from Davis avalanche instability. So it was basically a, a nearly complete story. So let me show one more paper. This is concerning LBs. So that's, we also heard that standard thinking of MBL that it's, it's an in integrable phase, something I'm strongly opposed now, even if you believe that there is a transition. But anyway, so the idea was that if you, there are the tau Zs, which appeared in many talks, and uh, then you can say how good this tau z is. Well, you can say, let me, this was um, uh, this paper in, in, uh, uh, by Zlatko and Dima. Uh, so you basically split the system into half and you will find slowest operator, which confines to one half of the system. And the idea that this will be roughly like L bit. If there is L bit, you should have a localized operator which lives in half of the system. If you can use the system size, its lifetime should exponentially decay. And that's exactly what is measured. And then there is a fit to exponential and uh, they say in disorder five. So they say, yes, we have L bits. We have numerical evidence for L bits. And these experiments by Emmanuel, which are truly beautiful, uh, which also show that there is a stability of this imbalance uh, at uh, a large disorder. Again, they appeared in this conference. So I'm just skipping all the details and saying, so I would say by 2018 situations are clear and only details are missing. And uh, here I, I uh, uh, always, when I, 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 I hear something like that, I remember a joke I read a long time ago. It's uh, uh, Dirac, uh, I actually don't know if names are correct, but that's how I read it. So Dirac sends uh, uh, a paper to, to Pauli and says that he almost figured out theory of, of uh, everything, only details are missing. And in response, Pauli sends him a blank sheet of paper saying, this is to prove that I can paint like Tichian, only details are missing. So basically this was the situation by 2018 and suddenly out of the blue, I mean, some people suspected something goes wrong, but at least in literature, published literature, there was consensus. And in 2019, like, there was this paper, which I already mentioned twice, I guess, that quantum chaos challenges many body localization. And it's truly challenged because I guess Lev can tell you how challenging it was to publish this paper. Uh, so I'm not showing results from uh, that paper, I just showed one, 
But let me say that this paper actually stimulated many other people to look closer into MDL. And after that, the situation started developing very rapidly. So this is one of the uh, papers which appeared after that. And this is by uh, Peter Sirant, who I believe will be here next week, so we can ask more about this. They repeated the manual block experiment. They looked into imbalance. And this is disorder eight. Remember, it's, it's two and a half times more than the transition. And actually what they see is that Again, I'm not responsible for stating that their methods are accurate, but this kind of results, similar results appeared in other papers as well, just for smaller disorder. Anyway, they tested their methods for a smaller disorder, they agreed with ED, so probably we can just really trust them. Anyway, Peter will be here, so if you don't believe, just ask him. So they looked into imbalance closer, and what you see is actually exactly this logarithmic time decay. And that's, if you recall, that's exactly what I told you what happens in, in this classical model. It's one of our omega spectral function. It's divergent chi. And of course, like I know people have, how do I know it wouldn't stop? Of course, I don't know. How do I know from numerics it doesn't stop? But then I ask, how do you know it slows down? There is no evidence that it slows down yet. So, and they put, uh, was there, and they, in this paper, they actually analyzed uh, not just this plot, they just did careful analysis they put the bound for localization at disorder equals to 10. And now I, I want to slowly start translating it to time scales because you say, ah, oh, it's three, it's 10, who cares? When we talk about tau less time, we go to time scales of the order of e power 35. And this is the minimal time, excluding critical slowing down. You need to observe MDL, which is there. Okay, this is so far numerics, but I'll skip, I'll show you some of more results, but let me just say, maybe, maybe emphasize a little bit what David said. So in 2019, 2022, by multiple uh, papers, including the one which David mentioned, um, was done by him and Vedika, there is a significant change in critical disorder by 4.5. And I just want to highlight, this means that all, meaning every single numerical paper which extracted either information about MDL phase or phase transition was transient. Every single one. We can rule out all numerical papers because say entanglement growth was checked at five and so on. If you think about logically what it means, it means that all numerics was in favor that MDL doesn't exist. No one really, again, from numerical point of view, no one really studied disorder 20 because of this disorder and this system sizes you see in mass. It's um, actually pretty remarkable. Now, RG schemes, we had to evaluate it. They're actually conceptual and even mathematical mistakes. So in this most cited RG paper, there is a mathematical error in appendix. If you fix it, it the paper predicts that there is no localization transition. And the error, it was subtle. I mean, it's a mathematical, mathematical error. It's like divergent integral is approximated by a constant. But the origin of this error, because the authors, like everyone else, assumed that there is a direct transition from ETH to integrability. So this subdiffusion, which leads to this divergent chi, actually makes all RG schemes I know about unstable. Because if you want these divergent time scales, uh, yeah, they essentially block, they read long relaxation times and they really block. Uh, uh, transition to integrability. They kind of push you back to ergodic region. Well, the fact that BAA arguments fail, it actually was known but not highlighted before because their arguments don't care about dimensionality. And there is a consensus that and they even don't care about the lattice and so on. So, and the issue, and somehow no one really, in my knowledge, so like it was known that something is wrong with BAA. But no one really highlighted what is wrong. And what's wrong is their main argument based on the small denominators. And I'll come to that. So, and my point will be the small denominators is not what's the issue with perturbations. So just to reiterate, so this is the plot which I showed. And now let's just look into a scale. So now we are saying that, that's what actually David literally was saying, that transition is somewhere here. 
So if you just think about this, uh, it just kind of tells you that all these measures are totally irrelevant. And I just want to say, it's not the transition at 20. Numerics was done up to 20, and there is no signature that anything goes on at 20. So if there is a transition, it probably will be at 40. Actually, there was a paper by Lev who pushed it to 100. So what's wrong with these papers? Well, there was extremely sloppy numerical analysis. So I just showed you this exponential tables, but then I, I did it myself. It's not published anywhere, but we just digitized this data. You kind of see that it's parabola, right? You digitize this data, you subtract the mean slope, and what you should see is something which grows slower than L, right? It's a bleeding correction. And here's a bleeding correction is a parabola. So actually, if you look at this slope, you conclude that this is not an exponential scheme. So this paper actually verifies that within numerical precision, there is no evidence for L bits. There is another paper where David was involved and it's the same story. You subtract the mean slope, you see this. So again, this numerical papers, which kind of support that idea of L bits, they actually say, if you analyze properly, that within numerical results, there are no L bits, they're unstable, right? Because finite size correction grows faster than the signal. Again, of course, you cannot extract what's going on from numerics, but you know that your hypothesis about exponential tail is just inconsistent with numerics. So this is actually the paper which, uh, David mentioned, but I want to show result by Dwitz. So this is exactly what he said. So it's like, we essentially, it's, uh, idea actually comes from um, uh, this paper, like David Gedeka and, and Alec, uh, Alan and others. So the idea is that, uh, well, they talk about open bus, but essentially what you want to do, you want to find the operator um, which commutes with the Hamiltonian and which has smallest overlap with every single spin on this side. And this is, if you want, it's kind of your L bit. Because if you have L bit, which is localized here, it will have zero overlap with this, right? So what you look into commutator of operator and any spin on the side and divide by operator squared, and you minimize this object. It's motivated by open systems, but you can forget about open systems. You just try to, to look for best admit. And this is better because now you have the full chain, not half a chain. And then, uh, yeah, this figure out, and that's what goes on. So this is some uh, lifetime scaled by four power L, basically subtract the mean slope. And that's what I was saying. This disorder here is like super strong. It goes from eight to 20, and you see really nothing happens. Moreover, you can check that uh, what, happen what only changes is average slope. So these curves are completely self-similar. So if you increase the slope, you basically, this L bit, I'll show you, in a sense, uh, how we understand it now, but you just see that L bit gets a bit longer, but then it, it, it's destroyed in exact same way. So, so it's not that critical disorder is 20, nothing happens to 20. It just, when you push further, you run out of computer. Okay, so yeah, and now uh, this bounds, which David mentioned, this put Taulis time to, to e power 70. So this is, anyway. So let's just see on the numerical progress of MBL disorder time scales. So originally it was tau -less time, like three times 10 to 05, reasonable number. But with years, this tau -less time was pushed further and further. It reached age of universe already, like during COVID years. It's now it's much longer. So one can say that actually as Vedika said, if age of the universe is there, why should we care? Of course we shouldn't care. It's just, we shouldn't say it's a new phase of matter, it's a glass. Uh, it's a very interesting phase of matter. I just want to highlight, I'm going back to classical systems and exact same story happens in FPU chain. For a long time, people didn't know whether it's ergodic or not. But recently the better computers, they simulated. So this is sort of entropy plotted in a very weird way. It's entropy with respect to thermal occupation. So entropy zero, means maximal entropy or thermal. Entropy one means you are not thermal. Anyway, so this is taken from this paper with actually the Wolf group, which is very recent. And what happens that here you plot energy density. And this is again, like small, but not too small numbers. And you see that as energy density gets smaller, 
you see this longer and longer, there's something which I'm not sure it's logarithmic in time, but something looks like almost steady, like let's call it pre-thermalization, but something super, super slow decay. But then at some point you reach the threshold to thermalize. Then if I would push this by a factor of two or three, of course, I will also use the uh, age of the universe. So in this sense, um, uh, these disordered systems are not special. Oh, I'm ran out. Okay, I'll probably borrow five minutes um, just to, to finish this and I'll, I thought I will have more time. Okay, I'll steal five minutes. I, I want to introduce actually, yeah, we kind of explained why there are no L bits and I want to spend like two slides on this if the chair permits. Uh, actually, David know, knew about this work, but he said that no theory exists. So I, I cannot call it theory. And to be honest, uh, initially when you try to publish papers or they talk to people, we were always had an objection. Yes, but you don't have a theory. So at some point I, I realized I don't know what theory means. So, but I, I cannot call it experiment either. So let's say it's mental exercise with element of analysis. So, and this mental exercise goes like this. So let's take a model of some system, which could be MBL or void if we don't know, and take a probe spin and weakly couple it. And let's try to construct local integral of motion for this. So basically we want to, and mathematically it's called Birkhoff normal form construction, but basically it's perturbation theory for operator. So we want to find operator Q, which commutes with total H. Uh, we can do it analytically only when epsilon is small, numerically for any epsilon. So this epsilon is like your boundary spin, but again, we make a weaker link to be able to, to do computation. So, and the idea that we do it iteratively, right, order by order, and well, because I'm running out of time, let me just say first order is kind of trivial. We just say first correction in one of them, V commuting with big term should be the same as uh, uh, original integral of motion commuting with small term. H bus doesn't commute with SC naught by definition, so you have only this. Anyway, you just see that first order correction is epsilon times H interaction. And then it turns out that you can continue this construction and you can find exact analytic expression, exact in a sense it's, of course, uh, expansion. Uh, so you just see expansion in nested commutators. And I kind of started in the beginning, introduces this operator spreading. So you just see this operator is related. You can construct in this Krillov space as a series. And then you ask how good is this operator? You stopped in n order and compute commutator of this operator in the Hamiltonian. And you see like the last commutator that we need. So the norm of this operator, which has a meaning of lifetime. And this operator is by the way, the same quantity G for AGP. It's all related. I'm basically looking into generator for the transformation. So it's norm is precisely equal to Liu William divided by V. And I kind of told you, I referred, so for any convergent system, Anderson trees, Bertie as it's convergent procedure when V is big enough, because this is exponential. You have exponential, you have one over V expansion, it's exponential. So if norm is also exponential, that's fine. If V is big enough, you converge. So it guarantees existence of Leons. But here for generic models, including disorder, disorder doesn't play any role here. We have factorial divergence. And actually what happens is that this your Leon behaves as N factorial, X factorial, X, N is like distance, X factorial divided by V power X. And that's kind of, at least qualitatively, this explains very well why you see this curvature, why it's always the white, this X factorial doesn't care about disorder. Disorder all only appears in the slope. So anyway, this non-theory explains very well what's going on. So this was a picture of Leoms, but in reality, they're like this. So you reach some system size or uh, Leom size, and after that, you cannot do anything. Just the last slide I want to show. Oh yeah, just what to say. This actually, if you combine it with this avalanche criterion, which David says, avalanche criterion says there is no MBL because Xi doesn't exist, it keeps growing. David was saying it will stop somewhere, but at least this non-theory will tell you that it will never stop. And the stronger the disorder, the better this non-theory works. So we can do instead of, but to point of, we can do variational approach in this Krillov space. We're just saying, let's find best integral of motion variation. So this excludes, them. of course it's numeric. And we see the same picture that it's, um, instead of increasing, it saturates. Anyway, the chair becomes nervous. So 
I, I almost finished, so I, I had a few more things to say. Um, uh, maybe uh, I'll just skip. This is just to say why disorder doesn't change anything. This is to say it's the same as what I was showing before. But I still say, say one second, or 20 seconds on the slide. We actually checked what happens if we simulate disordered models semi-classically. It's like a way, think about this as sort of self-consistent Hartree fork, but alternated Wigner approximation, semi-classical dynamics or whatever. So you can just simulate much bigger system sizes. And what happens, so you can even forget about quantum mechanics. Say we do some classical models with similar properties. And actually you see exact same stuff happens. You get this one over omega slowing down. Now you are not uh, limited by this finite size effects, Heisenberg times and so on. Uh, and moreover, you just see uh, that uh, in 1D and 2D, you have exact same story. So all these arguments, avalanche arguments tell you, no, 2D is very different on 1D. No, numerically, it's exactly the same thing. And again, this avalanche arguments, I personally don't believe in them because again, they say you go from ergodic to integral. This doesn't happen. Okay, so this is a summary of what I told you in, in two days. Yeah, I, I, I didn't say everything I wanted to say about MDL, but anyway, so uh, we have like kind of circular relation between chaos and determinism. We have emergent RMT or ATH uh, uh, description of ergodicity, uh, breaking, strong chaos, normalization, whatever you call it. Then uh, uh, I spend a lot of time saying that we can understand classical quantum chaos and ergodicity and distinguish them and probe them uh, uh, by the adiabatic transformations. And quantum classical systems, thermodynamic, uh, small, they all go in the same uh, footing. And of course, details are different, but they show all the same qualitative behavior, which is completely consistent with KM. So we have maximally uh, chaotic regime in a sense of the sensitivity or long time dynamics. And I kind of try to make connection that that's exactly how we think about maximal chaos, like if we uh, don't think about physics. And yeah, as I finish, so MBL, and it's, it's a glass, it's an interesting system, but it's not really special. If you have classical systems, it's the same. You take FPU systems, it's the, again, by the same, I mean, they have the same features. Of course, details are different. And uh, thank you for your attention. So just a couple of questions about this chi lambda parameter. Um, so one is at least, uh, if I noted it down correctly, it depends on the off diagonal matrix elements of the derivative of H, right? Uh, so again, what depends on off diagonal matrix? Oh, chi lambda, this uh, chi lambda parameter. Yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, then what you're calling the ETH value of the chi lambda parameter, in principle, that could have this matrix, the diagonal matrix elements violating ETH, right? So would that be like a relaxing regime that is not a good? Well, what we see that exponents are the same roughly, um, but of course values depend because I can make my operator two times smaller, right? And then of course the constant will become two times smaller immediately, even four because it's squared. So, but the slopes are kind of universal because for example, this, um, if you're in ergodic regime, you have constant, which is RMT result. And before that you have say in one dimension of R square root of omega, which is diffusive result. And those don't depend on observables. There are exceptions. If you use conserved quantity, or well, there are also observables which people like study, which is commutator of some local operator with Hamiltonian. Those immediately have vanishing spectral functions, but these are special operators. I just didn't want to go into details, but if you don't consider like very special operators, it seems they are roughly similar. When you're very close to integrable point, you start to see difference, huge anisotropy. Actually, what I didn't mention is that uh, all integrability of this whatever chaotic regime, it's extremely critical. You have scale invariance. It looks like quantum or whatever critical phenomena. I don't want to use word quantum. So close to integrability, operators which are parallel to integrability, they have very different scaling that are orthogonal to integrability. You kind of have divergent and isotropy. So, and there you have to be careful. You really want to look into geometric tensor, which is basically you have look into 
space of couplings, but this is like the susceptibility, right? So when you have many fold of couplings, a magnetic field, electric field, whatever, once you close to phase transition, you really have to be careful. Most couplings are the same. They're dominated by say largest critical exponent, but there are always ones which are kind of very special and you have to be very careful. It's exactly the same story here. So think about integrable points as critical points. And this is probably my best. So when it comes to chi lambda in particular, then it's more like the spectral function you'd say has more direct information about ETH and chi lambda. Is more yes, yes. I mean, of course you can look into moments of chi. So when you're exactly integrable, I'm not claiming that chi contains all the information. It's not true, but once you study fluctuations of chi, you have more information. Of course, of course in this chaotic non ergodic region, they fluctuate more because states are different. And actually, people also looked in this. Uh, uh, but you usually want to come up with relatively simple quantities. Like again, near phase transitions, many things become interesting, not only magnetization and so on. Chi is kind of good because it has direct physical meaning. Uh, geometric tensor set is even better. But yeah. Spectral function, I think, is contains more information because it's not just a number. And you know, you have more information, of course, you have a bigger, they like you can plot chi as a function of something. You cannot plot spectral function as a function of something because it's you, you need three-dimensional plot. So uh, one more thing related to chi, which is um, about the use of the term integrability. So you gave a classical analogy for chi, right? So if we imagine an integrable system. And let's say we do a very special perturbation that preserves the integrability, but completely changes the tori such that a given trajectory from an initial state becomes completely different. Then wouldn't chi be like large there even though this is- Yes, I mean, this definitely happens at the points of degeneracy. And this is something I didn't tell. When you break symmetries, even in integrable models, you start to see this. And something I didn't emphasize, but it was in my flight. Remember I said for Heisenberg model, spectral function for this two-spin model vanished linearly with omega. But if you now take integral, it's in logarithmically divergent. You divide by omega squared. You ask why? Actually, because perturbations, the Z breaks as U2 symmetry. You can view it as weak integrability breaking. Now, you, you can ask me, what if I happen like one, one half of integrals of motion? Or what I, I yeah, so chi is just a number. And I, I don't really insist uh, that it contains full information. But in most cases, what you are saying doesn't happen. So unless we have degeneracy or something, we have smooth deformation of integrals of motion. But if something interesting happens and the model, as you say, remains integrable, I'm not aware of the situations except for this symmetry breaking thing. You expect something interesting and it, yeah, one needs to analyze. But this long time, I mean, I would say main, main message, I guess out of this is that we can learn about chaos Again, in all cases I know, by looking into not short time response, but long time response. So, and now you can study a structure factor in space, time, whatever. You can, you have more information if you do it in space, if you're in many particle models. Uh, you can study different operators and so on and so forth. And yeah. yeah it, we'll take one question there while we set up. And, uh... So if you look at the Lapinov spectrum in your chaotic, the classical for me, pasta love with the last and for the quantum, quantum uh, how would they differ? I don't know. Uh, no, Lapon of spectra cannot. So your prediction would be they would be, the yeah, same. at short times they're the same for sure. I mean, at least but you want the long time, right? Yeah, so it's sh for surely for s equals to 100. I will recover classical Lapunov exponents if I do what you see, it's big enough. Again, I don't want to be too sure, but that's what I suspect. Uh, in all cases we check, like SYK when uh, quantum and classical exponents are the same. Largest in thermodynamic limit may not. Oh, you are talking, no, but then no, there are I'm no Lapunov. No, no, quantum mechanically, there are no Lapunov exponents. That's what Tamash Prozan proved. That's what I mentioned last time. Quantum mechanically, you see no Lapunov exponents. Or s equals to one half. Um, but you see same long time. That's why I'm just saying long time uh, lowest frequency spectral function. This well, it's turbulent. If you, I mean, your picture was of 
Yeah, but uh, so then that should have a level. You have to define turbulence for spin one halves then. Yeah. It's yeah. probably some low. Yeah, but then you really need to think how you define that. Yeah. Maybe if you look into extended operators, maybe you can define notion of Lapunov exponents. I agree with that. I don't think this was studied. And even the proof of Tamash talks about local operators. Yeah. I go about global operators, but most likely will recover, recover classical physics. Because when you, but again, look, I don't want to, to say to, but you just see semi-classical dynamics at short times works extremely well in the truncated reading. So whatever you can recover at short times should be the same quantum mechanically in classical. Okay. Okay. I stop there. <laughs>